Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Clinical Immunology Society Early Clinical Immun um, Early uh, Clinical Immunologist Committee webinar, where we present interesting cases on immune deficiency and discuss them. Um, I would like to remind everyone to please keep yourself muted and please use the attendee chat to share your questions and ideas. We'll be going through them as we move forward. And so I would like to start with by introducing Jenna Essink. Jenna Essink is a pediatrics resident at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Children's Hospital and Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. And her senior mentor is A.L. AL Greenbaum, uh, who will be providing some expert commentary on our very rare case. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jenna. Hello, everyone. Um, so the present or the title of my presentation is called Primary and Secondary Immunodeficiency When One Plus Two Equals Trouble. Um, so, okay, there's a little bit of a lag there. Um, I'm just going to start off by just going a little bit into depth about um, kind of when we initially saw this patient. So. Um, birth history was pretty um, insignificant. She was, um, this little gal was born at 36 weeks, um, four days. Um, pregnancy was complicated by IUGR and then microcephaly. Um, her newborn screen was um, slightly abnormal in the fact that she had um, tyro tyrosemia. Um, but otherwise was normal, including um, all of her, um, including like um, immunodeficiencies. Um, she was admitted on day of life eight because she had some poor feeding. Um, and because of her abnormal newborn screen and because of her microcephaly, genetics and metabolics were both involved. Um, MRI was then that showed that she had lysencephaly and then um, genetics tried to do some custom exome sequencing that was not able to be obtained. Um, they did some like general testing, but everything came back normal. Um, and then metabolics essentially said that um, the increased tyro tyrosine was likely due to an immature liver or protein loading, but didn't like match um, other diseases that you would um, see with that. And so didn't think that that was cl um, clinically correlated. Um, she was discharged after about a week, but had two additional admits for poor weight gain. Um, ultimately got discharged home with a um, NG tube and then um, came in day of life 50, was found to be um, due to abdominal distension and some vomiting, found to have hypothyroidism and discharge after a week. So spent a little bit of time um, uh, on some of our inpatient floors um, her first couple months. But um, what really got things going for her was at four months of age, she was noted to have weight loss, sweating with fees, poor PO intake, um, and um, she had a chest x-ray done down in our ED that shows kind of on the right here, her um, nice big heart, um, had an increased pro-VNP. So she was admitted to the PICU where they later did an echo that showed that she had a pretty low ejection fraction at 9%. Um, ultimately was diagnosed with a dilated cardiomyopathy, but there was, um, I'll go into a little bit more detail later about kind of what led them to say that it was a dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, but because she had been in the hospital so frequently with some, um, definitely some abnormal findings, genetics was re-involved, who recommended that she have a skeletal survey, a repeat MRI, and then um, they were hoping to get some expedited genetic testing done. Um, her skeletal survey um, showed that she had a multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, um, looked pretty heavily at her spine to see if there was anything, um, like any type of like spinal involvement, and none was found at least um, at four months of age, um, which kind of led them as far as like her genetic testing to go down possibly a dwarfism, a primordial dwarfism pathway. Um, but because of her um, large heart, um, also or was concerned about possible muscular dystrophy or a mitochondrial condition as well. Um, her repeat brain MRI um, showed that at this point of age, it looked appropriate for her age, which is why um, they had kind of said that this is also likely or could be a primordial dwarfism. 
So her genetics came back pretty quickly. Um, she ended up actually having um, nine um, different um, variants, but I've only listed the four that um, were really pertinent for her. So she had three variants in the, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong, is that RNU4 ATAC is how you say it? I believe that's how you say it. Um, she had three variants um, in this gene, um, two of which, I would say even the three of which were um, pathogenic. So um, she had one in the 46 position that was in trans that was pathogenic and the nine position that was in trans as, and that was a known pathogenic um, mutation. The 123 and cis with the um, N46 um, in some studies had shown an unknown significance, but I think uh, there was more re there's been some more research too that also says that this is likely pathogenic um, as well. Um, and variants in these genes are associated um, with three specific diseases. So Lowry Wood syndrome, is it Roifman syndrome, and then multiple osteodysplastic primordial dwarfism type one. Um, and then her um, the other thing that came back that um, was significant for her was a variant in her XC1 gene. Um, and this um, um, specific gene, um, in looking through some literature, it looks like was not, there's not as many, um, there's not many reports of this specific gene causing tons of problems. Uh, I think there was one of like a 13 or 14 year old gal who had um, some heart failure with this specific mutation, but just due to her presentation with this ejection fraction of um, 9%, this was um, considered most likely pathogenic um, and it was related to an autosomal do um, dominant cardiomyopathy. So more about this RNU4 ATAC um, gene. So this um, gene is located on the second chromosome. And um, this gene is, I would say, like unique in the sense that it encodes a small nuclear RNA, not a protein, um, which is what we typically think of when we think of mutations causing a problem is in a protein, whereas this was in, this is in a small nuclear RNA. Um, and its job is, it's part of a minor spliceosome that's um, required for um, excision of introns. Um, so the fact that this is an RNA and that its job is to go through the DNA and, um, splice and then take those introns and put them into, um, further proteins down the line, um, likely relates to, or explains the fact that you can see lots of different phenotypes asso associated with variants in this gene. And then looking at the actual gene structure that I have posted or that I have here, um, there's a couple areas that they've shown have significant or you're more likely to when you have variants in these regions, you're more likely to have um, problems that are pathogenic. So um, the important one is going to be the one that's in red. So that um, stem two area, um, that one is specific for um, Reifman syndrome. Um, most patients who get diagnosed with this end up, ha or, um, end up having at least one and are sometimes, um, or oftentimes have a homogenous mutation, um, in this area. Some of the other areas that are also important are the STEM1 area. And what makes those, the STEM1 and STEM2 area important is that it helps with the kind of the, the catalytic conversion of, um, actually doing some of that splicing. Um, the other, another area that's important on here is the small um, protein binding site that's off to the left of the three prime stem loop. Um, this area is important because that allows for other proteins to come on um, to the area when it's doing its splicing. And then the five prime stem loop, um, which kind of has a lot of the white and blue um, triangles on it is also a pretty important area as well. Um, I might, go, I'll go to the next page, but I might come back to this one. Um, so kind of what these um, diseases are, are um, 
So to start with the most severe of them is going to be this MOCD1. Um, this one has, or I, I guess I'll start in general, these diseases have a lot of, um, Mm, there's a lot of overlap between these diseases. So you'll a lot of times see um, IUGR, poor growth, microcephaly, retinal anomalies um, with all three of these syndromes. Um, right now, what really like makes from at least from a um, phenotype um, classification, um, the um, MOCD1 is associated with spondyloepimetaphyseal dysplasia. Reifman is a spondyloepimetaphyseal dysplasia also has cardiac anomalies. And then Lowry Wood is multiple epiphyseal dysplasias. And so more, so Lowry Wood is not associated with spinal involvement where the MOPD and the Rothman syndrome are. Um, however, there's quite a bit of overlap then too, even between MOPD1 and Rothman syndrome. So you can see things like immunodeficiencies, eczema, joint dislocations um, with both of those as well. And, um, why this is, in, I guess, more is important is because um, MOPD1 is um, associated with more severe disease. So lifespan for these um, children is not very long. Um, Rothman syndrome is a little bit less severe. And then Lowry Wood syndrome is going to be um, the least severe out of these. Um, but you'll, but in reading um, case studies about patients with all of these syndromes, there is tons and tons of overlap as far as um, their phenotype goes with these patients. And so I think right now, um, based on some of the phenotypes, um, they get or they get diagnosed on phenotypes based on some of the skeletal things that they're that have been seen. Um, but I think really, um, the literature is showing that there's actually a lot of overlap between all of these diseases, and that it's more likely a spectrum than it is an actual um, specific disease, which is why, which is what I tried to highlight here with the Venn diagram. Um, as far as um, going more into that genotype, which I kind of said that I would talk more about. So in the end, our little gal was diagnosed with a Lowry, with Lowry Wood syndrome just based on her skeletal survey and the fact that she didn't have any vertebral involvement. However, um, skeletal anomalies are one difficult to identify early in life, but also um, it doesn't necessarily her um, phenotype doesn't necessarily match her genotype because. Um, so just basically, when you when you're looking at some of the um, pathogen, uh, the variants that are associated with these diseases, uh, MOPD1 really has a heavy um, preference for having mutations in the N51 position is the most common. Most of these patients will also have um, are either heterozygous or homozygous for um, problems in that five prime stem loop. Um, so that was that area that had kind of a lot of like white. Um, in blue triangles. Um, Reufman syndrome, actually 11 out of the 11 patients in one particular study, 11 or all of those patients actually had at least one mutation in that STEM2 area, um, which is where our patient has a mutation. And then Lowry Wood is um, one of the more recently diet or recently defined syn um, syndromes, but there's no clear pattern identified there. And I just want to go back and kind of just show again where those are. So the five prime is going to be right here. And then the stem two is right here, which is where our patient was. Um, so kind of moving forward, this patient was ultimately listed for a cardiac transplant, um, was, which was difficult just because of her dwarfism. Um, and then Lowry Wood is not typically associated with immune deficiency, so there was no evaluation prior to transplant. She had um, a couple um, bacterial infections prior to that, but um, weren't really looked into a whole lot just because of the fact that she was in the hospital for so long. Um, her course kind of, she, she did have a transplant kind of at the end of 2019. Um, she was about seven months old or so. Um, she was placed on immunosuppression. Um, she inevitably got a trach. She had a G-tube placed. 
Um, at one point, she did have some leukopenia and some neutropenia. Um, so they decreased some of her immunosuppression. She got discharged. Um, she did come back in at one point for um, biopsy negative rejection and then got later, later was admitted again for um, um, anti mild antibody and cell mediated rejection. At that point, um, she was started on serolimus and then tacrolimus was continued. Um, as far as she did decently well after that, but then in April of this last year, um, she was reported to have um, some loose and watery um, stools when she was at her cardiology appointment. So they did a PCR, found that she had norovirus. Um, she did pretty well with this for a while, but then in June, she was admitted um, to our PICU for hyponatremia and evidently was found to continue to be positive for norovirus. Uh, she was here for about a week, got discharged because her electrolytes were better, um, and then was admitted a couple days later because of continued um, diarrhea. So at this right, point... So let's take a minute here and just kind of in the chat, you know, and uh, Amit pointed out, you know, a couple of questions. Was there a history of consanguinity in the family? No parental testing was done. And for the lower wood mutations, two of the variants were paternally inherited. One was maternally inherited. Um, and at, up to this point, beyond evaluation around tra cardiac transplantation, no immune testing had been done. And so this is the first point any immune testing has gotten done. And so when we're hearing about a patient with secondary immune deficiency from immune suppression, plus this diagnosis of Lowry Wood, you know, for the group, and please put in the chat, what would you like to look at? What should we be considering? And if AL has any uh, anything you'd like to add, please feel free. Yes, so for a great presentation, and uh, there's some more to come. But uh, the point is that there's a lot of immune suppression that the patient is currently receiving, as well as immune suppression that the patient had received in recent uh, months. So it will make the laboratory evaluations very, very challenging. So just keep that in mind. And I would also add this patient was um, unstable from a volume and perspective, anemic, and um, and so drawing labs was a bit limited at the time. So uh, why don't you go ahead and continue on, Jenna? So we did a, essentially an immunology workup, and we looked at her immunoglobulin levels and then looking at her um, T and B cell um, levels as well. Um, her uh, immunoglobulins, which are at the bottom, were um, very low. So um, you can see those down there. And then um, as far as her um, T and B cells go, um, her T and B cells were also um, remarkably low. But again, she has had immunosuppression. She um, has had her thymus taken out because of uh, during the time of um, transplant. Um, we did not do any of the um, vaccine kind of responses because of um, the amount of like blood that it would take for those as well. And then just being on the um, immune suppression that she was on. Um, I did a little bit of digging just to kind of see um, with, with the, with those lab results, just how the immune what does the immune, do, immune system do when um, there is a neurovirus infection? And it seems like this is a pretty, there's not a lot that's actually un, well understood about the actual immune response. Um, and there's lots of theories that relate to both T and B cell, but it seems like, and then an, um, antibodies as well, but it seems like in general, it seems like it's more of a coordinated response because there's, you know, patients with um, SCID who, um, have good B cells and they have problems and those without um, B cells um, have a lower rate. So it's, I don't know, one of the wonders of the immune system, um, kind of how it responds um, to um, a neurovi neurovirus infection. Um, when it comes to people with primary immunodeficiencies, um, 
chronic norovirus does is more common in people who do have a common variable immunodeficiency. Um, there is an article in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in 2019 that pretty small subset of patients, but it just looked at um, general patients um, compared to um, some of these um, immune deficiencies and just looked at um, their markers and kind of chronic norovirus infections and just found that these patients have um, lower like T and B cells in this um, case, but they generally had a um, lower um, proliferation um, in response to the norovirus as well. Um, and then in solid organ transplant, we can expect that patients were suppressing their T cells, like that's what we um, we want to do, but diarrhea is a pretty prom uh, common problem in those patients. So about half of patients with a solid organ transplant end up having diarrhea at some point. Norovirus tends to hit um, those patients a little bit harder though. It lasts longer. They end up needing more anti-diarrheal agents. Um, and there's not any good um, reference as far as like how you treat them. So um, there's lots of things that you can try to do. So reducing immune suppression, um, you can try oral or systemic immunoglobulins. Um, there's medications that you can try, um, antivirals. Um, but everything that I looked for, it was kind of just like case by case where some people um, did respond to it. Some people didn't. Um, really, the mainstay is supportive treatment with fluids and electrolyte replacement. And I think that, I don't know, maybe it brings a, so I don't know know what most people do as far as like therapies go or that so, they have found more successful um, for norovirus um, with these chronic infections and then kind of discussing why or if this is more from an immune suppression because of her a possible immunodeficiency or if this was a problem because of um, suppressing her immune system. System. So let's put this back to the chat. So we have a patient that we know has both, that we suspect has some degree of secondary immune deficiency, uh, also has some degree of primary immune deficiency, and also has a history of rejection. And so in this patient, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear from the group, what strategies would you take? Uh, while people are adding to the chat, there were a couple of questions. Um, I mean, asked if PNP and ADA enzymes are part of newborn screening. They are not automatically part of our newborn screening, and this patient did have normal TREC. Um, it was also mentioned that this patient also had a total thymectomy as part of her treatment in 2015. Um, for ale, the the there were some lymph nodes on the exam to suggest the presence of B cells. And um, Matthew Kahn had a question in the chat. Um, Jenna, from that article you quoted in the for Neurovirus and Skin Patients, pre-transplant, post-transplant, or both? I believe that that was pre-transplant. So I could, I can look that up and get back to whoever, but I'm pretty sure that was pre. All right, so using the chat, what are people's strategies? Or, Ale, if you'd like to comment. So, uh, first of all, uh, to answer the question in the chat, norovirus is a quite common pre transplant in patients with severe combined immune deficiency. It's very difficult to get rid of norovirus. Uh, some of the strategies that we have used is prolonged treatment with uh, oral immunoglobulins. Um, um, Often we cannot reduce immune suppression uh, without consequences and uh, uh, either uh, because of the primary immune deficiency or if this is post-transplant because of the risk of uh, rejection. Uh, we have used uh, methazoxazide several times uh, with um, some success. Uh, we have not used ribavarin in our patients. I think we also have uh, Dr. Holland with us, uh, infectious disease expert, worldwide infectious disease expert. It will be interesting to hear what he his experience is, as well as the other members of this chat. So I would just add that our experience is just as good as everybody else's, and that is it's terrible. 
and um, I think the oral immunoglobulins are um, widely used and um, not as widely successful. There is a, a trial being set up uh, through um, one of the investigators here and with Children's Hospital in Washington to um, use um, expanded T cells that are directed at uh, norovirus. Whether those will be effective, um, whether those will be safe, uh, remains to be seen. Thanks. All right, Jenna, why don't you go ahead and continue on with what happened in this patient? Uh, so she, we've been, we did about all of it. We tried um, initially, um, we tried um, nitazoxanide. Um, we gave, she tried that for about 10 days, essentially had no response. Um, we, at this point is when we started to realize that she had low immunoglobulins. And so gave her IVIG and she had that um, multiple times. Um, and was essentially given in, until she had a goal of, until she hit a goal of 800 as far as her IgG goes. Minimal response with that. We tried oral Ig. Um, we gave her eight doses. Um, minimal response. We tried to. Under attention, please. Oh. Hours. Sorry, I'm in the hospital right now. Um, but we tried to minimize her immunosuppression. She ended up going into um, rejection, didn't have a response with that. Um, and because of um, the rejection that she went into, we she inevitably had to um, go on high-dose steroids with a prolonged taper, which worsened her um, illness for a while. Um, and she ultimately continued to have dairy. We, I can't say that we actually treated it, uh, and she was actually, she, but she was able to go home actually just a couple of days ago. Um, all of these recommendations that we had were based on our um, immunocompromised infectious disease, disease team here, um, but never fully treated it, but had her at least stable to where her electrolytes remained normal. Um, and some of the um, take home points that um, I just wanted, that I was trying to hit, there was a lot to cover, I feel like, when going over um, this um, specific um, gene and then also discussing uh, primary versus secondary immunodeficiencies, but just wanting to highlight the fact that um, the mutations um, associated with uh, this specific gene are likely more of a spectrum of a disease, um, just due to the fact that they have the same underlying defect versus an individual disease. Um, and so, um, and it's important to have kind of a multidisciplinary approach when treating patients like this. Um, and maybe we could have looked at her immune function prior to her transplant. I don't know, but just trying to involve as many people as possible um, when dealing with one of these patients so something doesn't get missed. And then, um, again, looking at um, primary and then just discussing um, primary versus a secondary um, immune um, immune suppression in this case, and how to treat norovirus well if there is a good treatment for it. Right. Thank you so thank you so much, Jenna. Excellent presentation. A very uh, very rare uh, and complicated case. Um, Al, do you have any other thing, anything else you would like to add? No, I, I agree that uh, Jenna, you did a, an amazing job. Uh, I'd open it uh, maybe to the audience. Uh, there are a few questions about a GI biopsy, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if anyone uh, saw that. Uh, the, the biopsy, a biopsy was done, and it was completely normal, except for the fact that there was no biopsy. So I'll only add, and really it's just to emphasize Jenna's uh, point, this is probably a spectrum or an overlap of disease. Uh, many, many people uh, provided important input into the development and understanding of RNU for ATAC uh, mutations. But I think that uh, it's become clear that all of these patients should be thoroughly evaluated for uh, their immune deficiency. Some will have immune abnormalities, some will not. There's a spectrum. We have 
uh, more than 20 patients that are followed at sick kids. Um, and so the more you look for it, the more you find. Some of our patients are 40 years old and have been followed by us for more than 30 years. So definitely a, a significant spectrum of disease. And again, Jenna, great job. Thank you. And thank you for all of your help. All right, so I will go ahead and turn it over to Carolyn to introduce the next case. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Carolyn Balo, and I will be the moderator for this second case. Our case will be presented by Chris Cummings, who is a, a medical genetics fellow at University of Nebraska Medical Center. And um, we also have uh, the good fortune of having Steve Holland join us uh, as our senior mentor. So Chris, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. Okay, perfectly. Uh, it says I may be having some internet issues, but everything seems to be working on my end, so we'll, we'll proceed. Okay, there it goes. So I, um, as Carolyn said, I'm a genetics fellow, so my goals today are to um, mostly talk about the role that genetic testing can play in the diagnosis of immunodeficiency. Um, and then especially towards the end, hopefully we can have some discussion also about the limits uh, that, our, that our testing still encounters. So this was a case that um, both Dr. Niebuhr and I were eventually consulted on. Um, and it was a, a six month old male who came to our ED with a chief complaint of right thigh and leg swelling. Um, his symptoms started the day of his presentation and really just looked like, um, like swelling. There wasn't an associated color change, didn't seem to be uncomfortable, um, didn't have any real warmth um, to note. Um, our patient did have a fever at home and did have some increased loose stools, but didn't have any other real localizing symptoms to speak of. Um, he did already by six months of age have an interesting past medical history. So he was born at 34 weeks, um, did have a, a NICU stay, mostly working on feeding, um, but it also had an admission at around three and a half to four months of age. Um, he had left leg cellulitis, so the opposite leg of, of his current involvement, um, got a day of IV antibiotics, finished a course of Keflex, and, and that resolved. Um, and then in between that admission and this current presentation, so a period of, of maybe six weeks at most, um, also had a couple of interesting episodes. One of right cheek warmth and swelling that um, went away without any further treatment, and then a pustular rash on his back that did require um, treatment with mupirocin and, and amoxicillin. Um, he is up to date on his vaccines through four months, and then his family history, um, you know, we did the, the full three generation pedigree, really not much there outside of his mother's Bichette's disease. Um, he didn't have any siblings. Okay, so here um, are some pictures from when he presented to the ED. For his vitals, you can see he was febrile for us too. And here's his right leg. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but um, just kind of uniformly enlarged from the hip down to the foot. Um, I did include in the ED exam, they thought it was a little bit warmer, but that, that wasn't consistently found from, from examiners and it was subtle if anything. Um, you know, he was moving it well, didn't seem uncomfortable. Um, and then the only other pertinent exam finding is really his back from those pustular lesions that were now in various stages of healing that hopefully you guys can see in the, in the picture on the right. So the workup from the ED, he had a leukocytosis, um, had elevated inflammatory markers, he had a elevated D-dimer and fibrinogen. Um, the ED actually was worried about a blood clot, and so they got uh, dopplers of his right lower leg, but but did not reveal a, a clot. Um, they did get, a, did get an x-ray that I've shown there, 
just had some, some I would say, nonspecific findings. Um, they started him on clindamycin and the ED. He had pretty immediate onset um, diffuse erythema. And so they gave him Benadryl for, for a reaction, switched him to ANCEF, and admitted him to the floor. Um, and then after admission, his blood cultures ultimately became positive for enterobacter. And so we've built in a couple spots for discussion here. And I don't know, Carolyn, do you want to jump in or? Um, yeah, so if we can get folks to go ahead and pop in the chat, what is your level of concern for immune deficiency in this particular patient? Um, if you are concerned, what would be in your differential diagnosis and why? And at this point, what additional evaluation are you thinking that you might like to have? And um, Dr. Holland, if I could maybe put you on the spot while people are thinking about that to put it in the chat, what, what are you thinking right now in this case to this point in time? God, I'm just loving it. I'm just loving it. So what are you thinking? You're realizing here's a kid coming in with um, two episodes of skin infection early in life uh, and a swollen foot or swollen leg, I should say, that doesn't sound like an acute cellulitis. Um, and um, now you've got evidence for uh, bacterial uh, infection. So, you know, there, there aren't too many things that are really making you wonder what causes what might be lymphedema, if it's not obviously obstruction and it's not obviously um, cellulitis, what causes lymphedema along with bacterial infections? And that's going to um, shunt your um, uh, differential. And it, you want to keep in mind that, that it might be unilateral uh, lymphedema. And there are a couple of things to think about. Yeah, so uh, GATA2 deficiency is a very important thing to, uh, to recognize there. And, you know, could this be GATA2 deficiency? I suppose it could. Unilater unilateral lymphedema would be high on the list of things to, to think about here. Um, and the, the organisms were what again? Um, the blood culture grew enterobacter. The urine culture okay. was negative. Right. So you had a skin infection early on that got treated uh, on the left leg, right? That treated was treated as an outpatient and responded. And then Enterobacter. Enterobacter is funny because um, how many of our, how many of the, the primary inf uh, immunodeficiencies that we think about are really associated with gram negative rod bacteremia? It ain't many. It ain't many. And um, that I think is a clue here. GATA2 deficiency in general doesn't do that. Um, Enterobacter can occur in chronic granulomatous disease, but it wouldn't be, you know, the first organism you'd think about. I'll stop there. So, yeah, so in addition to, um, I know we've commented on the GATA2 and the CGD that I've seen in the chat here. I also see some folks starting to think about NEMO as well. So Chris, could you tell us, is there anything abnormal about about this patient's hair or anything else in terms of uh, dysmorphic features, growth issues, anything like that? Um, yeah, no, not really. Um, he actually had good growth when you corrected for his six weeks of prematurity. Um, yeah, I know you're, you're talking about the ectodermal findings. I, he didn't have the thickest head of hair, but nothing, nothing that would really stand out for his age. Right. Well, let's go ahead and, and move practice? along and see what you guys did. And I, I missed that question. I'm sorry. Has he started to oh. cut teeth yet? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I I don't recall. I'll be honest. Oh, Dr. Niebuhr does recall. She says no teeth yet. <laughs> um, great. Yeah. So the next portion, let's see. Are you guys seeing a slide? I just have a back black yep. screen now. We are we seeing your slide with values. all the flow numbers. Oh, okay. Well, I might just pull, oh, there it goes through for me too. Um, awesome. So 
these labs, you guys no doubt know better than me, so I'll uh, have uh, three slides of um, of lab data from when Dr. Niebuhr was consulted from, from the immunology perspective, but I'll let you guys look over those a little bit. Some of the highlights that I pulled out, um, low cytotoxic T cells, naive cytotoxic T cells, um, memory T cells, the proliferation studies had low CD45 and CD3 positive responses to PHA, um, would highlight the IgG level of 65. Let's see. Okay, um, here's the data for the NK cell cytotoxicity assays. Wait, wait, so help us understand, what made you go back and do an NK assay? This kid, did he have a lot of viral infections? I thought his NK numbers were normal. What was the reason to do this? Um, that, if Dr. Niebuhr would love to join in, I, I would love some assistance with that. In all fairness, we got the NK cell cytotoxicity a bit later on, and the lymphedema was the primary reason for getting it, not infections. Because you think NK cells control lymphedema? Uh, looking for associations. But that wasn't, in all fairness, this wasn't obtained until after genetic testing came back. And so just when you look on that genetic, on the uh, immunologic testing, uh, Chris, um, what did you guys mm -hmm. make of the immunoglobulins when they came back? Yeah, let me go back to that slide. Yeah. It's good to see that he's got no IgE, so that takes Job's off the table. That's great. But what else mm -hmm. is going on there? Um. Is that IgG low in the Nebraska laboratory? Yeah, I was just looking up our limit. I think isn't it, Dr. Neighbor, you will probably know better than me, but I thought it was in the in the 200 range would be considered um, the lower the lower limit of the normal range, but so for our lab, the IgG is listed as low. The IgA is uh, on the low end. Um, IgM and Ig are both normal for age. Thank right. you. So, yeah, I just think that would so lymphedema and hypogam um, uh, with a gram negative rod infection puts you into a different uh, category altogether. Um, and let me just show you the other. Sorry, these are loading so slow. Okay, um, just the other data slide I have for for this section for the DHR flow, um, just the the plots over on the right, and then just um, that they showed normal neutrophil oxidative burst function. And so we're having you know a little bit of an ongoing discussion, but I did build in build in another slide here for people to refine their their differential after seeing all those lab values and and talk about next steps. Yeah, so please continue to put your thoughts in the chat. I'm loving the discussion that we're seeing there. Um, there was a, a question about whether he was able to sweat. Uh, it sounds like it's it's relatively unclear given the, the time of year, but nothing particularly abnormal was noted. Um, we do have a question as to whether the patient um, continued having any lung infections. Yeah, and we will we'll get to that. But they they developed kind of a um, insidious course of a of a lung infection, kind of a gradual onset of hypoxia. Um, and I have some more imaging studies we can talk about shortly. Mm -hmm. And any organisms isolated from the lungs? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I like the there there is no spring season in Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I agree. <laughs> what about, we're getting questions about proteins in the lungs. Did we think it was PJP? A few days. Um, no, no, no thoughts on either of those. Maybe I'll jump ahead to the, to that part. There seems to be some interest in that. Yeah, let's do it. Let's see if I can get my slide up.
Your slide's up for us. Are you guys seeing it? it? Okay, now it comes through for me. I think I'm the last to see it. Apologies for that. Um, so yeah, here's that additional workup in clinical course throughout his hospital stay. So um, he was on broad spectrum antibiotics, but really didn't have um, much more than, than minimal improvement of, of his right lower leg size. Um, interestingly, he did have some recurrent episodes of redness and swelling of his cheeks and then his other knee, his left knee, um, throughout, throughout the stay. And then, um, kind of the, the big finding here, you know, he just, it wasn't any major events, but he continued to have some trouble with, with feeding where he hadn't before. He was having some trouble with his motor skills, like rolling, which was a skill he was able to do ahead of time. Um, and then developed kind of, um, I would say relatively mild hypoxia and had some imaging studies that I've, that I've shown there, um, both concerning for septic emboli, both on a MRI brain and on a CT chest. Um, he did, as a result of that, have an echo, which was normal. And then he had a biopsy that um, showed, quote, no signs of infection or inflammation, but rather a large amount of serious leakage um, during the biopsy. And so I know people have you know, been discussing uh, lymphedema, and that I think is really, the, this is the, the point when that became more, more clear that that's what was going on rather than, you know, a, a recurrent cellulitis or something like that. Can you just um, help us, Chris, when you call it emboli, um, that suggests that there is a focus of, um, you know, a vegetation that is breaking off and going around. Um, and yet you mentioned that the echocardiogram didn't show that. Where did you think that the emboli were going or coming from? Because it sounds <laughs> like he's got them on the left side and the right side. Yeah, that's a good point. Not not any clearly identified source. I think that terminology was used more just because of the pattern of these multiple micro hemorrhages kind of scattered diffusely rather than, than on anything else. Um, and this is also the point when we got involved. Um, and so this is just taken from our consult note you can see kind of a summary of the case so far as we've gone through it. And then our initial genetics workup. So we did two genetic tests in the hospital. The first was the primary immunodeficiency gene panel that Invitae offers. It has about 400 or so genes on it. And unfortunately was completely negative, um, not any candidate genes even. Um, and then we also did an array uh, mostly for the these loss of motor skills um, more than anything and the poor feeding and also because it's something we can get really easily done in the hospital with with a quick turnaround time but th that was completely normal too and so the the next test we did which was um, coordinated and then completed after he was already discharged was whole exome sequencing which Fortunately, we're able to do on more and more of our patients as, as a either first or second line study, in this case, second line. Um, but it, as you can see, was also non-diagnostic. So we found a single hemizygous maternally inherited VUS in L1's, L1 cam, um, which if you, if you read about L1 cam related disorders, it really just didn't fit his phenotype would not have explained his immunodeficiency um, and so didn't seem like it was the answer for him. Um, but in conjunction with that... Why don't you stop there? Oh, okay. oh sure. I can That's go fine. back. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> but, but I think the question that, that you all were grappling with, and it's so important to, to focus on, is how do, you, how do you decide when to take that next leap? Here you did everything that was easy to do, and or not even easy, and <laughs> you didn't have an answer. What made you push to get the NK function and to do this, um, you know, second or third line genetic testing? And where did you go to do it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, from a from our perspective as the the genetics consultants, this is where we would rely heavily on the on the immunology 
perspective and and those um, labs and the and the lymphedema are really what pushed Dr. Niebuhr to to get us back involved and request this testing. Um, you know, there are there are certainly a, a, a different subset of diseases that we're more proficient in in diagnosing, I would say. But for for the immunodeficiencies, you know, interpreting the the labs and and narrowing the differential, we're going to rely heavily on our immuno friends as as we did in this case. And and so yeah, I would I, I has got a job lined up here. Exactly. <laughs> I I would give Dr. Niebuhr all the credit for for pushing us to to order this test. Um, and so the the result that you that you guys can see here is another um, hemizygous variant of uncertain significance. Um, this one, you know, in the IKBKG gene, uh, also known as Nemo, and it's a glutamine residue that's that's duplicated. All right, no, it's loading. Okay. So I have um, on the bottom just kind of a, a sketch, I guess I would say, of the 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 IKBKB IKBKG gene, and then above that the the um, protein domains, and have a with the red arrow highlighted where this patient's variant was. Um, and the short version is that it wasn't a variant that had been seen before, and so that's a big reason why. Uh, probably the main reason why it was classified as a variant of uncertain significance. Um, you know, there are variants in the CC2 domain, a co coiled coil domain that are associated um, with NEMO immunodeficiency, but they're more typically in lysine residues uh, as the sites of post-translational modifications. And with this being a... a a duplication and involving a glutamine, uh, not to mention not having been seen before. For, for all those reasons, it was classified as VUS. And so I saw this mentioned in the chat, but you guys, some of you might be wondering why, why we had to get this special testing. You know, we did a pretty broad gene panel and we did whole exome sequencing and this didn't come up and and it's because of this pseudo gene which is also on the x chromosome in reverse orientation to ikbk gene and so um next gen sequencing technology just has trouble mapping um reads basically when you when you have this highly homologous pseudo gene and so um they're fortunately for you know, most of the clinically relevant genes that have pseudogenes are specialized tests that you can order if you're, you know, if you have the clinical concern to, th to think of this, to add this onto your differential. Um, and so, so that was the case here. Um, this gene's normal function involves activation of the NF kappa B pathway. And it's interesting to us as geneticists because um, complete loss of function mutations in in this gene are associated with IP incontinentia pigmenti, um, whereas variants important in the uh, the immune, immunodeficiency syndrome are are more hypomorphic alleles. And also of interest, especially to this case, um, is that maternal carriers of pathogenic variants have been identified with Bichette's disease, which was the case for, for our patient, um, and also with, with other autoimmune disease. And so we did, there it is, um, just familial variant, variant testing, just specifically looking for this dupl duplication in the patient's mom, and we did find that it was present. So this is a maternally inherited variant. Um, they're still classifying it as a VUS, but it certainly raised our suspicion a little bit more. Okay. And so then just updates, um, kind of getting towards the end here. Our patient is now 12 years old. Um, he has received I IVIG once, um, and Dr. Niebuhr is working on um, getting approval to, to possibly continue that. He's on some prophylaxis. 
and then he's still dealing with those loose and, and actually bloody stools. Um, he follows with GI here at the Children's Hospital and is, um, carries a diagnosis of FPIAP and is working on um, eliminating some dietary triggers for that. So then last, um, really just talking about next steps. And we were hoping to get, I know we're, we're getting close to time here, but we're hoping to get a little bit of discussion if, if people have, have points to add. Um, we're not pursuing any further genetic testing. Yes, it's a VUS, but it's, it seems to fit the phenotype and there's not really a whole lot more <laughs> broad genetic testing we could pursue at this point. Um, VUS resolution is, is an interesting topic, and we can talk about that if people are interested. Um, in short, it's typically difficult to get a lab interested <laughs> and somewhat time consuming, but, but important. Um, and then obviously talking about next clinical steps, um, including what people's thoughts are on, on moving towards a bone marrow transplant in this case might be. Yeah, very interesting um, case here. And so one, if you wouldn't mind just briefly clarifying for everyone, if they are really suspicious for NEMO, what genetic test should they send? Oh, yeah. So it it, um, it really is the, the test focused in on that IKBKG gene. And it's, um, it's purely because you can't use next-gen sequencing and you have to have um, primer specific to the gene and, and long read PCR rather than next gen sequencing because of those problems with mapping. Um, and ours, I think ours went through in, in Vitae. I can't remember we if it was in Vitae or Gene DX. I might have to pull up the report and see. Um, but but yeah, there's a there's a um, a test that just focuses in on that one gene is what you'd want to order. Because yeah, as we learned here, you won't find it on on your your panels. You won't even find it on your um, on your exome. And Dr. Holland, um, can you give us some additional thoughts here? We've got a really active chat, but we're running close to time. So right. can you just kind of give us some, some final thoughts on what you might do about this VUS and, and what might be good next steps for this team to take? So I think, um, you know, this, uh, this looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. And, um, <laughs> I would be comfortable that this VUS is in fact causal. However, you know, the chat um, has sort of um, uh, intermingled things that are molecular, that is long range sequencing, or uh, in our lab, we generate cDNA and then sequence that because it only comes off the authentic gene. But, um, you know, we, you want to be careful about what are the um, functional tests to verify that it's important. That would be about um, NF kappa B, you know, I kappa B degradation. You could look at TNF generation. Um, you could look at a variety of things. I think in this kid's case, you know, he had bacteremia with a CRP of two, and you haven't told us much about fevers. Um, none of these are are ironclad, but um, he definitely sounds like he's got Nemo. And as somebody points out, he's likely to have teeth by now. None of these are, just like in the case that uh, Ail uh, discussed, there's nothing that is an absolute in Nemo deficiency. It's got lots of different ways it can can present, but the constellation of problems here, lymphedema, gram-negative rod bacteremia, um, hypogam, um, uh, all of these things really suggest that that's a, a functional uh, variant uh, or, you know, a causal mutation. I think the question about bone marrow transplantation, I'm confident in the long run he really should have it. I'm just not confident that I know which way to do it yet because it is a tough haul and these kids don't always do very well. I'm hopeful that people will do a few more of these over the next couple of years and you'll have a better sense of what to do. But he won't do well. This is a bad disease and it does not turn out well. All right, well, thank you to uh, Chris and, and Hannah and um, also Dr. Holland um, for that really interesting case. And thank you for everyone for such a lively discussion um, in the chat. Um, hopefully that can um, continue uh, via email. Possibly this is even a good case to keep going on the list serve um, after this to uh, sort of get all of these good minds coming together and, and to try to help this child have the, the best outcome that he can have. 
Um, just really quickly, I am sure everyone needs to run along and has other things to do with their evening. Um, but we do always like to highlight um, a new article in the literature at the end of these sessions. I know we've had Alex, I'm not sure if she's still on, but I know we've had Alex Freeman active in the chat. Um, and this article caught my eye in um, Jackie in the in press section. Um, and I think it follows up what was presented um, at the last meeting really nicely where there have been a couple of groups that have reported um, vaccine immune responses in um, patients with inborn errors of immunity. And they were sort of small cohorts, but generally showed a good response. But maybe we still need some, some more data. Maybe we need bigger cohorts, patients with a broader array of immune deficiencies. And so that's what this group really tried to capture in looking at 83 patients with inborn errors of immunity in their response to COVID vaccination. And I'm just going to whiz through this really quickly. Please do go and look at this actual article. It's really wonderful. But you can see that whereas patients with inborn errors of immunity did seem to respond to the vaccine and generate antibodies, they maybe weren't as high after the second dose um, as those of healthy healthcare workers. This article also showed that there were certain forms of immune suppression and certain diagnoses that were associated with a more impaired um, uh, antibody response to the vaccine. Also specifically that particularly low T cells and B cells were associated with poor antibody response. And that in terms of treatments, it really wasn't immunoglobulin replacement. It really wasn't JAK inhibition. It was really rituximab that seemed to be the therapy that impaired response to uh, the COVID vaccination. And so uh, in summary, we think that vaccinating these patients is really safe. There is some safety data in this article as well, but the immunogenicity might be affected by certain therapies and certain gene defects. So we really might need to use this very personalized approach in guiding patients with inborn errors of immunity um, regarding prevention of COVID-19 infection and the need for subsequent boosters. And with that, I would like to thank everyone very much for joining us this evening. Thank you again to our presenters and to our senior mentors. Um, please, if you are interested in presenting a case in the future, um, contact the Early Career Immunology Committee, and we would love to have you present on one of these webinars. Have a good evening, everyone.